a dare decided who lived and who died in those days in North Belfast. And I used to say to him, now, where are you going? And he would say to me, where am I going? I'm going to make the news tonight. I decide what you watch on television tonight. Go home and watch it. That, that meant someone was going to die. Few people in this country strike as much fear and terror as Johnny Mad Dog Adair. There have been times I've been picking targets, choosing targets, targeting targets. Now, if language, is that killing people? Well, engaging with the enemy, let's just say. Engaging with the enemy. How many bodies does he have in his hands? Well, people talk in terms of 30. They say you're only as good as your last operation. And under my direction, C Company had been involved in many, many, many professional operations against the professional IRA. And yet he's willing to risk it all just to humiliate his enemies. It could cost me my life if I'm not careful. Then these people were to capture me. I've no doubt that uh, they would kill me. No doubt whatsoever. Over a 20-year reign, Adair directed more than 40 killings and hundreds of attempted murders. Today he's living in exile in Britain, looking for a new place to call home. Banished from his Belfast home after a murderous feud with other loyalist paramilitary leaders, Adair and son Jonathan, known as Mad Pup, have teamed up with gangster Mark Scarface Morrison. The quiet seaside town of Ayr is no stranger to visitors from across the water in Northern Ireland. But recently the landmark station hotel found itself playing host to some less welcome guests. Excuse me, turn that camera off. About 30 loyalist paramilitaries on the run and less than keen on being observed. These days, Adair is lying low in the Scottish town of Troon, ever watchful for assassins bent on settling old scores. In turn, Adair himself is being monitored by MI5, Strathclyde Police, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, Greater Manchester Police and the National Crime Squad. Troon is like a, uh, a quiet town for, 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 for um, well-off people and um, most of the bars, that, which I don't even frequent, but apparently, I'm barred in quite a few of them, for no reason, other than I am who I am. Just stories about, about my past and about the fact that I served 16 years in prison and the fact that I was involved in terrorism. They just don't seem to let the past lie. So what do you do all day? Bits and pieces. Um, business interests. Kept very busy. Was a wee bit of training. Johnny Adair won't talk about his business interests. He says he survives on benefits and the goodwill of loyal friends. Adair, who like Lady Thatcher and the Queen, refers to himself in the third person, denies being a major drug dealer though son Jonathan has served time for selling heroin and crack cocaine. I don't know if it's the police or the, the media who's saying that I'm a fucking drug dealer. How could someone like Johnny Athar possibly fucking deal in drugs? How could someone like Johnny Athar possibly be anyway associated with him? Johnny Athar, I have no doubt, is under 24 hours surveillance by the special branch, no matter is it here in Scotland or if it's in Manchester or back home in Belfast. Without, I mean, that, that's, that's, that would be a fact. So I, I, it would be suicide for me to try anything illegal, let alone drugs. The only drugs Johnny Adair admits to taking are bodybuilding steroids. Do I take steroids? Well, does Popeye take spinach? As a teenager, when I was involved in 
street clashes. I uh, uh, had a number of head wounds where I'd been hit with battles, stones, hurley sticks and hammers. I'd been hit there with a hurley bat, the fighting Catholic use, and here I was smashed with a hammer. In the back of my head I'd been hit with battles, and in here I'd been shot point blank range as I attended a UB40 concert in back home in Belfast. That was the most recent wound. And um, ten years ago, it was the IRA riddled my car, and they, they, they just grazed me here. I was, mar- I was lucky; I was just grazed there on the side. And then, some twenty years ago, I was stabbed in the back here, which resulted in me having to, having to have my spleen removed. And I've been stabbed there with national shoes and and street clashes with them. And just all in all, I had scars about my face and teeth knocked out as a result of fighting. The actual gunman, the, 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 I now understand, the actual guy pulled the trigger, is himself dead, but he, 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 he committed suicide whilst living down in Dublin. Uh, one of the other ones that, that physically assaulted me that night was himself murdered by the professional IRA using the cover name of direct action against drugs. So um, they're dead again, and I'm still alive. A lot of your adversaries, right? a lot of the people who are trying to kill you are dead. Themselves, without me having to fire a shot at them. Interesting indeed, isn't it? I'd like to see what will happen to the people that are uh, still around. Only Johnny Adair knows how many bodies lie at his feet. He claims those days are behind him. But many believe he's now operating as a gangster under the directing hand of a Scottish underworld godfather. Adair's enemies, and he has many, are watching their backs. Good afternoon and welcome to this tour of Belfast. On this tour, we're going to bring you through areas which you've probably seen on the news and read about the newspapers. Okay, folks, we're just bringing you into the Shankill area here. You'll see the colours of red, white and blue. Now, a loyalist is someone who is loyal to Her Majesty the Queen and the Crown in England. This area, in particular, at one time, was controlled by a man you've probably all heard about, a man called Johnny Mad Dog Adair. Johnny Adair controlled this area with an iron fist. Adair enjoys the limelight. But even he would be surprised to learn that he's become a tourist attraction. Now, if you look straight out the window, you'll see a large UFF mural. If there's such thing as a good mural, this could be it. If you watch the gunman's eyes and the weapon as we leave the area, both the eyes and the weapon follow you the whole way around this area. This area erupted into chaos in a murderous feud between different loyalist factions. Loyalists are once again at each other's throats. The UDA took brutal and decisive action to rid the Lower Shankill of Adair's supporters. Local people claim several carloads of men linked to Johnny Adair attacked two houses and a car. We saw literally dozens and dozens of men, lots of guys that were fighting, punching, kicking each other. Those who remained loyal to Adair had no choice but to leave. Adair's gang were run out of town. It emerged that loyalist paramilitary leader Johnny Mad Dog Adair has moved to a Scottish seaside town. Strathclyde police said the presence of Adair was clearly of interest to the force. So what's the tattoo you're getting now and why? I'm getting a UFFC company one. The words in Latin, um, actions, not words. C company was, a, was an army that were men of actions and not words. The machine itself, it, it, I suppose it's like a gun, really. Like the needle, it doesn't actually, you know, cut you. It punctures your skin. But a lot of people take it better than others. I think you're in pain there, to be fair. I think you've just been brave. And is it sore? Of course it's sore. Yeah. The land of a said it wasn't. You're not going to faint? No, I hope not. I've got a Chelsea football. I know, and you've fainted. Do you know my tattoo? <laughs> but you're not a brave heart, don't you? I know. You're an Irish Celt. 
Jonathan can't disguise the pain as well as his dad. Though as a teenager in Belfast, he did suffer an agonizing punishment shooting for antisocial behavior, widely accepted to have been ordered by his father. What did they do to you? Well, it was top up an alley and it was told to sit in the ground, kneeling down with my back against the wall. He showed me putting the bolts in their gun, I just told him, he listened to Skid over and done with. He said, get it over quickly. Well, I just don't want to be waiting about it, thinking about it, you know what I mean? Before I knew it was, it was shot. And what, where did they shoot you? Both calves. And he just left me. And I tried to get up and walk, but I walked, I walked a bit, but I ended up falling again. Any scars? Uh, yeah? Mm hmm. And that was basically and the same in the other leg, yeah? Same in the other leg, right? But that was, that was through my tattoo. It was a bit raging, that leg. It was through the, you know what I mean? See it there? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the truth, it wasn't that bars and them cars, and different with my kneecaps. That's, that's off lately, getting that. And the police say, it. who did it? Oh, I just told him to go away. None of business. Well, I think Jonathan was mad enough to take his punishment, and he, he, he realised that uh, he wasn't getting any special treatment because I was his father. He was just treated the way any other. A uh, teenager in that area would be dealt with uh, if they crossed the paramilitaries. But despite the family's best efforts, Jonathan went on to become a drug dealer. 19-year-old Jonathan Adair faces 10 separate charges of conspiracy to supply and supplying Class A drugs. Jonathan Adair sold heroin and crack cocaine to undercover police officers. Gina Adair, seen here in a white hood, appeared at Bolton Magistrates Court charged with conspiracy to supply heroin, cocaine and crack cocaine. The shadow of drugs has followed Adair his family and his organization. It's accepted that your organization finances activities to of millions of pounds, fund your political operations and your military operations by racketeering, extortion and drugs. That's accepted. That's, not that's a fact. That's a that's fact. A fact. Okay, yes. right. So, so loyalists and Republicans. Of course. So, so, so because of the organization involvement in drugs, racketeering and extortion, presumably, you know, it's no wonder people think, you know, Johnny Dare, well, his organization ran drugs, extortion, everything else, you know, now the next yeah. business is going to be drugs yeah. for you in Scotland. Yeah. But, what, but what the people, the, the people just need the look at my background and, uh, and other so-called loyalist backgrounds and see who has the wealth. Johnny Adair doesn't have the wealth. Johnny Adair was a soldier, a freedom fighter. But nowadays, Money was never his god. That's true, but nowadays people say, listen, here, the expertise to run an organisation around yeah. millions of pounds of extortion. Yeah. Are you going to take those big multi-million pound extortion drug operations to Scotland? No. To Britain? No, to Bolton? No, no, because of the breaking the law. OK, but you know, the sense then they say Jonathan's locked in there, he's done this time. Yes, and he's not doing it again. Jonathan, uh, quite foolishly got involved with drugs in Bolton and um, as a result he received five years in prison. It done him the world of good, he's out now, he's clear of drugs yeah. and he'll never run down that road again. Yeah. Neither will his father. Yeah. You, you won't be kneecapping him if he gets involved again, will you? Absolutely not. Adair's buddy in Scotland, Mark Scarface Morrison, is not a terrorist. He's what police call an ODC, an ordinary decent criminal. His 64 convictions include assault and fraud. He's known as an underworld fixer. But today, Morrison is happy to call himself a consultant. So would you be the consultant the street sells? Well, allegedly, I'm a fuck up, would you? Yeah. Well, as the ADC of the underworld. <laughs> Scotland. <laughs> I suppose I would be uh, a man of the street, to, to, be, to be honest, you know. And, uh, I would be known as probably a street, a street player. I'm certainly not a gangster, absolutely not. How did you get the scar? The scar was allegedly, uh, it was a contract put out in my life, foolishly, with two underworld figures who are now both dead. Uh, and three masked men kicked my door in. I was at a prison that very day and three masked men kicked my door in and attempted to kill me at half past three in the morning. Allegedly one of those men got shot five times in the head outside his front door and another one died of a fatal accident, so who knows. Who'd have shot that man? Absolutely no idea. Would you know a man who did? Possibly. Would you be well informed? Like I say, I'm a man of the street. Smack my 
But within days, Mark Morrison, the underworld fixer, is taken off the streets, having received a prison sentence for a brutal assault on a young woman. Adair keeps a brave face. The worst case scenario could have been murder, <laughs> but it wasn't. Thank goodness. What was the charge? No, it was just, just assault. It wasn't that, not that serious. Coincidentally, Adair received a conviction for assaulting his own estranged wife, Gina, a woman dubbed by her enemies as Mad Bitch. Just hours after being released from jail, renegade loyalist Johnny Mad Dog Adair has admitted assaulting his wife in a drunken argument. Adair was seen punching his wife repeatedly and dragging her by the hair. Johnny Adair has also lost his beloved Alsatians. Once his mascots, they are now being held by one of his paramilitary rivals. You stole them dogs. You're an evil man, Desmond. And I want them back. I found out where you live and I'm coming to, I'm coming to confront you for my dogs, Desmond. Let's see, there we go. Let's see what happened. What are you going to do? You're going to kill me? But I don't want no violence. I know you're an evil man. I know what you're capable of. But I don't want. I don't want to com c c confront you or to, 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 to face something like that. I just want my dogs back, Desmond. What? When you're six foot under. See, that's using felons, Desmond. Why? I just... No, you're an evil man, Desmond. You're a convicted drug dealer, Desmond. You've stole my dogs, and then you're threatening that they would kill me if I come face to face with you. Or I to you. I am asking you, Desmond. I'm not threatening you. I'm, I'm begging you. Des, I, I'm even begging you. Would you please... No, would you Would you please give me my dogs back? I'm offering you £3,000 for the safe return of Shane and Rabba, the two dogs that I dearly love, Desmond. Please do. Okay. Well, that's when I come to your door. Meanwhile, in exile in Scotland, Mad Dog Adair is looking for a new friend. Mad dog. <laughs> no, she said, some of the staff think you look like somebody. Somebody called Mad Dog. I love German Shepherds, and that's why I'm here today. Hopefully, they get another one. And this wee one here looks perfect. It's obviously it's been a wee bit. It seems frightening, but um, hopefully I'll put that right over the couple of weeks and couple of months and make it a good home. Yeah. Adair is keen to nurture the support of his other loyal friends. Lottery millionaire Michael Carroll has asked him to stay the weekend at a suburban village home. Well, we're hundreds of miles from my home. Uh, we're in Norfolk, uh, where I'm going to visit my friend, Mickey Carroll, who you would all know as the, the, the lottery millionaire. This is the shop where he bought his first and only lottery ticket which he won nine or ten million pounds. Could I have a lottery ticket, please? And I'm going to do the same thing now. Hopefully I'm going to win it. Adair's friendship with self-styled lottery lout Michael Carroll began when the multimillionaire wrote to Adair in prison. Adair's fearsome reputation now offers the lottery winner protection from the many extortionists anxious to share in Carroll's good fortune. Already he is said to have lost nearly a million pounds. One party cost me... 28 grand. 28 grand? Had about 100 blokes, 200 women. Most people call them orgies, but I was unreal. 28 grand? On coke, on fucking booze. Oh, 12 How times. Have you ever had one go <laughs> like a <laughs> And one go. How much have you ever had at your disposal? Half a million. And one go at your disposable? Fuck. What were you doing with that? Oh, what is it? What? You wanted to see it? Yeah. Carol's hero worship of Adair works both ways. Carol enjoys the company of the terrorist legend, while Adair has big plans for the lottery winner. Mickey's going to fucking start a new battalion off the UDA in Norfolk. 
I think he's going to become the Brigadier. Do you see any problem with that, Mickey? No, no. Good <laughs> man. Oh, will you be yeah. passing on your oh, training yeah. and expertise to him? No, yeah. Mickey will be passing oh, on his yeah. molecular oil as prisoners. Help yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yourselves, isn't it? Help me, you do Mickey, open this. Go ahead. What do you put that down to, Mickey? Mental strike? Oh, the hand is down a bottle now. <laughs> In the lot conversion of the lottery winner's home is a secret room. Adair orders photos to be taken, a permanent record of the occasion. But this friendship was to be short lived. Days later, millionaire Carol traded his detached home for a prison cell after pleading guilty to a vicious assault on a group of young Christians at a gospel concert. Here in the former East Germany, a group of ex-neo-Nazis have found a new spiritual leader. One member even has a shrine to the man. Tony is a good friend of mine and I like him and his lifestyle and he's a great man with his charisma and he smiles every time and he's so funny and <laughs> That's the reason why I have a shrine for him and to see him every day and let him know he has friends here and they will stand by him forever. He is simply Tony and he is the best. They've issued an invitation to Adair to visit them in Dresden and the terrorist leader has accepted. Johnny Mad Dog Adair is visiting a loyal supporter inside a German prison. Nick Greger is a convicted neo-Nazi leader, trained in bomb making. I have uh, all the posters, posters yeah. of you and uh, photographs. It, it yeah. looks like uh, <laughs> it looks uh, my myself uh, looks like an uh, UFF headquarter. <laughs> I, I, <guess. laughs> I thought we need someone like Johnny over here to lead us and uh, we couldn't find someone like Johnny over here so uh, we was going to Johnny, <laughs> you know what I mean. So that's, uh, we, we chose him uh, to, uh, yeah, to be our chief. My struggle is uh, uh, to uh, support you and, and uh, to protect you or if you have uh, trouble. My message uh, to this uh, UDA Brigadiers is uh, so, uh, should someone go and uh, uh, shoot uh, Johnny again or uh, uh, attack him or whatever. So we will be able to send uh, five guys over to Belfast. That's not a problem. So we have our uh, 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 Jackie McDonald find and everything. We know we know where to find these guys. That's uh, not a problem. And we don't need an army to carry out a punishment beating or something like that. 
We only need uh, a small group of volunteers and these are guys, they are very well experienced, uh, experienced in uh, carrying out punishment beatings and whatever. I, I know how to, uh, to, make, to, build, to, make, uh, to create a, a land mine, you know, or a pipe bomb and uh, uh, all these things, a uh, uh, bobby, tra uh, bobby trap bomb or you know all these things. I, 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 I uh, got teach the things when I was in South Africa in a training camp and all this stuff. I, I know how to do this. So uh, I, I just want to say we have the, uh, the know-how to carry out a punishment beating uh, even in Belfast. That's uh, not a problem. Yeah, Johnny, Johnny, yeah, that's also, yeah. We have to enjoy the day. Yeah. Maybe you, you bring him to a uh, nightclub and uh, he can use some money in the nightclub. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you have to taste uh, to test a, a German woman. <laughs> yes, of course. After acting as a dare's bodyguard in Bolton, Nick Gregor was banned from entry. Christian, you must be really passionate about me and my family. Yeah, yeah look, there's a new tune. I wonder who this is. It's that's you, that's Tina. you, that's you. It's Tina. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> Adair basks in his international support. A legendary terrorist pinup assured of his place in history. But he is far from being yesterday's man. Some fear that Adair is already taking his battlefield skills to underworld Britain. Adair is as much a threat today. Anywhere he lives, it would be at Bolton, Edinburgh, he will always be a threat. He's a gangster wrapped in a Union Jack. That's all he is. In his heyday, Adair was a don with a passion. And at the core of that passion was violence. Do surrender! I fucking loved it. I loved it. I thrived of it. It was my life, Foxy. Do you remember? Ah, of course I loved it. I fucking just was married to it, that organisation. I lived, slept, dreamed, breathed that organisation. That's just the way I was. Under Adair's direction, C Company are understood to have been responsible for over 40 murders and hundreds of attempted murders. He rarely gave interviews but could never pass up a good photo opportunity. At his peak, Adair seemed untouchable. Adair didn't have to ask permission from anyone to do anything. He thought nothing of having the volunteer £100 or £200 to walk his dogs. Instantly recognizable, Adair made an easy target. On an outing to see his favorite band, UB40, he was shot at point-blank range. And do you feel you're, you've been quite lucky? I mean, uh, shot in the head, I mean, it, it could have been a whole lot worse. There's not many people get shot in the back of the head and just walk away. A bullet in the head wasn't enough to stop Adair running an empire built on drugs, extortion, prostitution, money laundering, and the distribution of weapons. A dare had to be stopped. I told him, I'll put you in jail. And he should said to me, you have to catch me first. John T. Brown led the team who built the case against the dare. The terrorist leader was tailed, bugged and interrogated until finally John T. got his man. Mad Dog was snared. And started screaming and shouting with their guns and pointing them on all as for the open the doors. The next thing they started banging at the back windies. The next thing the back windies went in and they just grabbed everybody that was here. Now, twelve years later, Adair is free and Jaunty Brown is in nervous retirement. <laughs> he isn't joking at Hey. He claims Adair tried to bomb his house something the terrorist leader denies. Today they've come face to face at a neutral location in Manchester. 
John T. Brown comes with a message. Security is on hand just in case. Who's your two friends, Mr. Brown? You're not afraid of me, are you? No, indeed I'm not. Well, why do you bring security? Yes. You falsely accuse me of um, a bomb in your house. If your home is attacked in the manner that mine was attacked. And my home's been attacked more times than yours. Well, that's true. To take you out or to put you down in jail was a policing imperative. But my pursuit of you was professional, not personal. It should never be taken to a family. Hmm. Well, you took it to my family, didn't you? Go ahead. He's me. raided my house on a number of occasions. He's smashed my doors in. He's sledgehammered my doors in. With the job, he's handcuffed it? me. He's handcuffed my wife. He's took us away to holding centres and held us for days upon days. Whether you're involved in crime by way of terrorism, gangsterism, drug dealing, prostitution, you'll, you'll suffer house searches. If you put yourself in a frame for directing terrorists, you can't complain when a detective sergeant comes after you like an Exocet missile. Chanti's message turns out to be a warning. If you go back to Northern Ireland, you'd be shot dead. As simple as that. I would say there'd be people lying, queuing up to kill you, the UDA. As we speak, they're trying to whack you. They don't care whether it's in Bolton or Troon or wherever, but they'll get to you. Talk is cheap, you. Janta. It's easy to jump on this stage and read out statements that we're going to kill you, Johnny, out there. I've heard it all before throughout the years. Action speaks louder than words. And if you don't watch yourself, you're going to end up dead. And why? Life's too short. Well, Life is too short. It's There's more to life than loyalism. But Adair doesn't take kindly to being told where he can and cannot go. Six of the so-called brigadiers threatened to have me murdered. To date, two of these so-called brigadiers are now themselves six foot under, dead. And Johnny Adair is still standing here talking. Johnny Adair will return home soon. John T. Brown has warned that should Adair return to Belfast, he will be killed. This sparks an idea for an ambitious yet potentially deadly stunt designed to humiliate the very people that are threatening him. He's hatching a plan that puts two fingers up to those baying for his blood. What I always say, I always say, he who laughs last will laugh the longest. And what goes around will come around. Despite the death threats, Adair is planning a trip to Belfast with military precision. It's a 600-mile journey from Scotland through England, Wales, the Republic of Ireland and a late-night border crossing into Northern Ireland. Decoy cars and safe houses are planned in conditions of utmost secrecy. Hello? Once we head the wheels, we board the ferry, it brings us into Dublin. We'll travel by car across the border to the north of Ireland. Then we'll be taken to a safe house. Um, we'll run the field at that safe house. And we'll put it the effect our plan. <laughs> If I'm not careful, then these people were to capture me. I've no doubt that they would kill me. No doubt whatsoever. There is a in Dublin now. I'm hoping that the party don't stop me on the way through. Because if they do, I believe they'll alert the PSN I know the border. And that obviously uh, they will put me under some sort of surveillance and this is what I don't want. I want to be able to go in. <laughs> what 
Oh. Rotten. Rotten. <laughs> I mean, the 2005 Aero Axis is here. Thanks, please, please. Well, that's good. <laughs> Come on. Johnny? Yeah? Yeah, home. You know who it is? Yeah. They know it's me? Yeah. Yes? Didn't say it, but they do, yeah. Have they know it was me? Yeah. How did they know this? To be frank, they wouldn't be doing the job, Johnny, if they didn't know. Well, if they know, would the UDA know? Yeah. Well. Obviously, the, the intelligence services have their. There are reasons of, of, or, of finding out what certain people's do, and obviously Mr Adair is, is, is one of them people who would be of interest to the intelligence services, whereas they would put him under surveillance, bug his phone, bug his car, bug his home. That's probably one of the reasons why we were stopped just coming out of the, the Shangle estate there. My fear is now, would the police leak to my enemies that, 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 that I am in the country? Mm. I don't know, but I'll not let it hinder what, what my plans are to do. Who's that guy there? They just you go over there. Coming in the, under the lower shangle now. This is where I used to live. And this is where my family was exiled from three years ago when I was returned to prison. An area that I love, and the people that I love. This used to be my homeland. This here was the badge that I'm proud of. At one time I was gone in this community, and now, sadly, the people who are now in charge violently turned to me and my family and my friends. And sadly, this area is now controlled by drug dealers, um, rapists, housebreakers, and just petty criminals. It feels strange. And it feels that the place is just, it's just, it's not what it was three years ago. It doesn't have the same atmosphere about it. I feel distance from it now. I feel, obviously, because the people that, that, that's in charge here now, I, I believe that they've ruined the community. They've erased everything to do with our culture in terms of murals and, and, and flags and everything to do with our culture. It's been erased. Johnny Mad Dog Adair is risking his life in making a secret visit to his native Northern Ireland. He longs for his years in loyalist West Belfast, the place he once ruled, though a third of those years were spent in jail. Referring to the maze, it was a, a home from home. The paramilitaries run the prison. Whatever we wanted on the outside, which was not on the prison talk shop list, we could send out word and we'd have it smuggled in. We had this guy who had an artificial leg, and every Monday he would bring in sirloin steaks, steroids, whatever we needed. He came in every Monday, took his leg off and emptied off all the contacts of his legs. We had everything from sacks, from uh, our own food, uh, just 
almost anything. They even had um, <laughs> blow up dolls. I can remember one occasion where some boys on the wing had one of them blow up dolls. Everybody else had budgies, which they were allowed, but I wanted to go one step further and I felt that there was a need to have a little dog run about. So I arranged to have a dog smuggled into the prison. One of Adair's associates in the maze was Michael Stone. In broad daylight, Stone carried out a brazen attack, tossing grenades at mourners at an IRA funeral. Well, the video of, of choice down there would have been porn. And what most of the prisoners would have done on, on a daily basis would have went to the porn king, who was Michael Stone. And they would have went over to Michael and, 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 and booked their porn movie for the night, because Michael had a sale full of porn movies. And uh, some of them would have been homemade and smuggled in from the outside. So here you can not only view porn f f movies from America, but porn movies from the greater Belfast area. You get drunk, you can party. <coughs> in fact, the prison authorities used to supply us with the disco lights for, for the discos that we had in the, in the wings. And even at the time, in the early 90s, people said, jokingly, that some of the best raves were held in the maze prison. And I, <laughs> I'd be honest, but there was some good parties down there. When not indulging in sex, drugs and rock and roll, I dare like nothing more than a good rooftop protest against prison conditions. Even today, mothballed and rusting, the Mays prison still holds huge sentimental attachment for Johnny Adair. As, as a young teenager in my early teens, growing up, I loved coming to visit Loyalist paramilitaries in this prison. When I came to this prison to, 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 to visit paramilitaries who had defended Ulster against the, their, their enemies, I felt really proud and I, and I felt an, an honour to come to the Mays prison and, and visit people like uh, Michael Stone and, uh, and other loyalist killers. It was like getting, it was like your parents buying you a toy. You were going into the Mays prison and you were getting searched for the first time in your life by prison officers. Then you were going in and you were seeing loyalist paramilitaries who, 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 who you would have looked up to and who most people looked up to and coming out of the visit, you, 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 the whole way home in the bus, you'd, you'd have talked about it, and you'd have talked about what other prisoners you had seen. Despite waging war on his Catholic neighbours, Adair admits that had he been born a mile down the road, he would likely have joined the other side. If I was a Catholic, a nationalist, I probably would have joined the Republican movement, and I probably would have fought for what they believed in. I would have probably been on the IRA Army Council. <laughs> In the mainland, you have a normal life. You can do, even me, being Johnny Adair, can do the normal things, which I couldn't do. I mean, could you go out in the past, I mean, for example? Mm, yeah. No, no. Nightclubbing, no. Concerts, no. Fights, boxing matches, no. Uh, yeah. I've had the best times of my life since I've been over in England and, and in Scotland, but it's not home. But will these newfound freedoms allow Adair to bring his military and criminal skills to mainland Britain? The authorities are ever vigilant. Um, he wouldn't serve me. And I ask him why, and he says because a photograph has been distributed and I've been told not to serve me. What's going to happen to the guy who takes you out? He'd be probably uh, held and uh, treated as a hero in some small, smelly, dingy pub with about half a dozen people drinking it. Until Nick the Nazi comes over to take him out? Well, Nick says that, uh, that if anything happened to me, he would most definitely come and 
please tell them about it. What's going to be on the, on the tombstone? Johnny Adair, volunteer, Johnny Adair, soldier, Johnny Adair, gangster? Johnny Adair, from volunteer to brigadier, no surrender, quite separate. Simply the best. It's the end of the film, Johnny. It's the end of the road. The final chapter has yet to be written, Mr. McIntyre. Until that chapter is written, Johnny Adair is resigned to moving from town to town throughout the length and breadth of Britain. Rome was never built in a week. And uh, one day, hopefully, myself, my family, and my close friends will return to our homeland. I'm only marking time here in Scotland. I will be going home to my native Ulster. I don't know when, it could be a week, it could be a month, it could be a year, it could be three years, but I'll be back one day and my son will be with me. Yet, wherever Mad Dog goes, his bloody past means he must remain ever vigilant for an assassin's bullet.